So let's imagine that this technology existed and you could implant fake memories into your head. What percentage of them for you would be like wildly sexual? <laughs> this doesn't exist. <laughs> there isn't memory transplants right now. I think that you can do this. No, you can't. You just don't know the right places to go. Wow. All right. To answer your question, uh, 75%. Is that, that's actually lower than what mine are probably is. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. there'd have to be other things in there, right? Like you yeah. want to have like some cool moments with your family and your children. Right, you want to have some sort of sense of athletic accomplishment. Like I'd like to feel like. Oh, I've that's done a good, good one. Right? But except um, with that, if that's if that's only in your mind, you don't get the public adulation. It's not like you win an actual World Series. You can go in a bar, everyone's buying you drinks. You walk in and your brain, you won the World Series. Everyone else, you're some f-ing guy. <laughs> that's fair, but you could try to convince everyone, right? Like. I wonder if athletes are well beyond their years and you don't recognize them and they still go to the bar. Like, are people going to offer them that? Yes. If they say they've won it and like to explain it. Like, if, if I didn't know the history of a sport and someone was telling me they were a champion, that I'd probably still buy them a drink. It depends on the... Oh, really? Yeah. I was going to say it depends on the city. Like, certain places, they like you know your sports heroes and a lot of them end up settling there because they can get probably yeah. free drinks for life. Is my... I picture Boston. I feel like what Boston's... I was thinking yeah. of. <laughs> I feel like Boston's Carl Yastrzemski place, yeah. can drink whenever he wants, <laughs> wherever he wants for free. Perfect. Oh, what a life. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And today we are talking about Total Recall, but not the good one. <laughs> the horrible f***ing remake with Colin Farrell in the Arnold Schwarzenegger role, which, I mean... That's a rough pull. Like, to replace Arnold with Colin Farrell is, is a tough one. I don't even understand it. The best thing I can think of is, like, this must have been right when Colin Farrell was, like, getting hot. And when you're, like, a new hot actor, they just throw everything at you. He starts out in the movie with his shirt off, and I can see sort of, like, I think he was popular amongst men and women at the time. That's what I mean. I think he's like a rising star, and so it's just like, you know, that when they're trying to think of who can we get for this movie, he's the answer to every question. Yeah. Every question. How about this movie? Colin Farrell. This movie. Colin Farrell. <laughs> he's hot. So hot right now. And this came out in 2012? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the original one was from the 90s? Ooh, you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> I believe it is, yes. I'm going to say early 90s, possibly even 1990. Okay. Was the original one also PG-13? Sorry, for those of you who don't know, Noel has never seen the original Total Recall, which to me is f***ing insane. (laughs) Yeah, maybe we should have said this before. Sorry. I have lots and lots of questions about this movie as we go through, and mostly because I know the first one was uh, sort of a... Massive hit. Yeah, a huge hit, and I have never seen it. And I know that that's sacrilegious probably for many movie fans. It's sacrilegious for me. I'm offended by this. I know. Because, like, you know, we have done two Arnold Schwarzenegger movies already, Arnold Schwarzenegger is probably, if I'm being totally honest, he's probably my favorite movie star of all time, just because for his peak, and I do believe that Total Recall is the absolute like peak Schwarzenegger, for his peak, he's just so f***ing entertaining, and those movies are great. Then uh, then I need to watch it. We're going to have to watch this together for a good movies and beer evening. I was going to say, this sounds like a bonus episode, yeah, because right. you know like what? It. It's kind of outside the boundaries of what we do here, because it's not, it's not a bad movie at all. <laughs> there are I, parts that are like hilariously yeah. dated, obviously, and Schwarzenegger himself is a little cartoony, yeah. like he is. But my God, man, it's so good. And this is just so not. Yeah, it's funny because my recollection of it is from the video game that came after it. And that video game was trash. Like maybe one of the worst games ever created. The NES, the Nintendo yeah, original. exactly. Yeah. And so I think I played that game around the time that the movie came out. And because it was so bad, I just never wanted to see the movie. Did you not want to yeah, see Yeah, which is a yeah. weird sort of connection, right? I sh- I'm willing to watch it with you. Did you also never see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the first one? Because that game was so f***ing hard. <laughs> I like that game. It's impossible. <laughs> it's so hard, but it's good hard. No. Let's get um, back to movies. We're going to watch. We're going to talk through the movie. Tons and tons of spoilers. And we're going to drink a beer that relates to the movie in some way. And today... We are drinking Memory Trace. How appropriate. Uh, And this is from the Rorschach Brewing Company. Uh, It looks like an aged bottle. A mixed fermented table sour. Yes, this is a cellared beer. Um, It's a couple years old now. Hope it's still good. Otherwise, we're going to have to re-record this with a different f***ing beer. But, you know, (laughs) we'll we'll give it a try. No, it's going to be delicious, I'm sure. We're going to open it up and, and give it a try. Rorschach. Uh, Toronto Brewery. Uh, we haven't drank anything from them yet, but I think we might have a couple down the lo- the uh, pipeline. You never know, man. Uh, we both ordered from them many times. Uh, it's a pretty good spot. Yeah. They have a lot of good fruited stuff. You know me. You love yeah. your beers fruited. I do. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> so, right. uh, oh, we're going to get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's crack it. All right, so we start with a... 
kind of like a crawl here. Not exactly a crawl. Is it still called a crawl when it's sideways? I don't f***ing know. We start with some title cards <laughs> talking about a little backstory here. That at the end of the 21st century, global chemical warfare has made most of the planet uninhabitable. Now living space is the most valuable resource on Earth. And two territories remain. There's the UFB, the United Federation of Britain, and the colony. Australia. Which, is that what it is? Yeah, this was really weird to me. So we have chemical warfare, and the two places that survive are Britain and Australia? I guess. I didn't put two together that it was Australia, but to be fair, geography is kind of my Achilles heel. <laughs> so I think they did this because a large part of what they describe right after is that they've connected the colony and the UFB by something called the fall. Yeah, and this is how workers travel from one sector to the other. And it's basically a giant elevator through the planet. Just so you know, none of this is in the first movie whatsoever. Oh, okay. So what caused the sort of post-apocalyptic or the landscape of the first movie? Anything? Or is it just like a future? In the first movie, they're on Mars. The, oh. The movie takes place on Mars. What? Yes. So then why is this one on a broken down Earth? I don't f***ing know. It was really weird, the choice then, because I had a lot of questions about why Britain... Britain's not in the first movie either. Okay. So this Nothing is... Oh, Britain. weird. Okay. I don't get it, man. I don't... I have no idea. Maybe if we had done more research, there'd be some sort of story here, but it's just, it's just not, we're right away. In my mind, I'm like, they're trying to make it different from the first one. Yeah, are they trying, so they're trying to set it apart a little bit, even though it's supposed to kind of be a modern adaptation of the first story, right? I, I mean, not even modern, well, I don't know. Modern might not be the right word because the, the first one's also set in the future. They're both set in the future. It's a more modern future. Okay, so maybe they're just trying to use sort of current technology of the time to make it feel more realistic. Is that kind of what the I think plan advanced was? technology in the first just, So the real the problem is why are they making this movie? Yeah, <laughs> this is right. That, like this is the problem. problem. Like why yeah. did you create this movie? Was it purely to get money? Yes. It cost 125 million to make. Did they make that much back? I'd like to think no, else? but I'm yeah. pretty sure they probably did just okay. off foreign distribution or whatever. Anyway, this is the backstory that has nothing to do with the first f-ing movie. We then have a voice saying "Wake up," and we have flashing lights. A bloody, dirty Colin Farrell playing the role of Doug Quaid that Arnold Schwarzenegger played in the first movie. Same name. Opens his eyes and sees Jessica Biel. She says, we've got to get out of here. There is a lot of running and shooting at some heavily armored or, I guess, are they robot soldiers? Yeah, we find that out later on that they are robotic soldiers. Yes. Okay. They almost make it, but one of the soldiers shoots some kind of taser lasso at Colin Farrell. Like, wraps (laughs) around him and it's, like, shocking him. They used this later, um, and I had a big problem with this. It was hilarious science fiction. It looks like they're shooting out those um, LCD lights that people have out in their rooms. Like teenagers yeah. right now love these. They go up and like sort of circle their room, and they can change the colors. Yeah, it's like a string of yeah. lights. I guess in 2012 they were like amazing future technology because they're <laughs> shooting them out of these Nerf guns and wrapping them around people to capture them. <laughs> yeah, but it works. I mean, they also shoot through his hand, I guess, while he's hanging on to her, because like she almost falls down some kind of shaft that goes to a sewer. It's not really clear. But they shoot. It goes through the hand. At this point, with the taser on him and whatnot, they've got him. So he tells Jessica Beale she has to go, but he says, I promise I'll find you. And then she falls into this fucking uh, sewer Water, shaft, and he yeah. gets pulled back by the soldiers. And then he wakes up again. It was all a dream. Yeah. You hear the wake up or he's being waken up by his wife. Played uh, by Kate Beckinsale. Yes. And immediately I wrote down, is this the dream? Oh, yeah. Well, you're asking the right questions. Now, we learn that he has had the same dream multiple times. And his wife is asking questions about this. She thinks that this might be her fault somehow. Is she making him feel trapped? You know, he says, no, that's not the case. And it looks like they're about to get down here for a minute. When suddenly she gets an urgent phone alert, there's been another bombing in the UFB. I guess we learn very quickly she's an EMS worker, so she has to respond to emergencies. Clearly, he's disappointed. They don't get to get down, but she has to go do her job. Yeah, she tells him to get some sleep, though, and uh, he says... Sleep scares me. Well, dream of me. (laughs) I don't know, man. (sighs) So it's after this point we start learning who caused this explosion, right? Yes, the news report tells us this is the fourth bombing. It is most likely the work of terrorist leader Matthias, which is definitely not his name in uh, in the original. No, was it also the like singer from Love Actually in the original? As well? <laughs> <laughs> no, but not Bill Nye. It was actually a uh, an alien mutant. So we were wildly diverging. Whoa! From this. So this is so this story is sort of a conflict between 
um, sort of a resistance group of fighters and a colonizing force of the British. Well, that's also true in the original. There is a resistance force fighting against the guy who owns the air industry in Mars. Because, you know, you need air to breathe, right? Okay. So you got to pay for it to live. So the first one was kind of anti-corporate and this one's a bit yes. anti-colonial. Yeah, yes. You know what? There. Yes. We've, we've gotten to the bottom of this. Okay. That's what it is. Colin Farrell has to go to work himself. Uh, we get a look at a very crowded future city. This is just pure CG. And as he's walking, he sees an ad for recall, offering memory implants of a different life, vacation, etc. Now, he's heading to work, and he bumps into his co-worker, Harry, played by Bakeem Woodbine. He's complaining to him about how they're always doing the same thing. It's the same day over and over. Nothing ever changes. We can tell he's very restless here. Yeah, so not having seen the movies before, not having seen the first one, this is where it starts reminding me of kind of like Matrixy stuff. Like I'm wondering if they like make a different choice or choose to do something different, if it's going to alter sort of a not reality that he's in. So I'm sort of having questions about what's going to happen. They decide to switch seats, right? And they yeah, that's the big the move. You want to that's see something different, we'll switch seats. And, yeah. and I'm wondering, like, is that going to affect it? Or maybe if they decide not to go to work that day, would there be something that changes? And Oh, you think it's a sliding doors kind of thing? Yeah, so I start having those questions because I've never seen it before. And at this time, I'm actually kind of connected or following and interested in what's happening in the story. So Well, that makes one of us. <laughs> this has me connected uh, to it at, at this point. I mean, if you need proof that he's restless and bored, just look at the fact that he's unexcited by the fact that this transportation method is basically uh, the amusement park ride drop zone. <laughs> they got like a free fall for like through the whole planet. Like it should be exciting. And he's just like f***ing done with it. Well, and it's pretty cool actually as they reach the middle of our planet. I don't know how real this is scientifically. Uh, the gravity switches as they go through the core and have to start changing sort of the direction in which they are. Yeah, they lose gravity, right? They're like floating. Yeah, yeah, so they go into sort of a low gravity scenario and start like rotating or floating around. That's why they have to be strapped in. Yep. Now, later on, he asked this same coworker about recall, and we hear a familiar story about a guy who went there and ended up lobotomized. It's the same warning Schwarzenegger gets in the first one. Clearly, his friend Harry is trying to steer him away from going. Now, later on at work, a different coworker who is the new guy tells him recall is actually great and that are the best memories I have. Now, I have to say, this is actually kind of a clever moment because they're working on the assembly line building these robot soldiers. They're called synthetics, I guess. Yep. And Colin Farrell warns him that if he's not careful where he places his hand, like a bolt can shoot out and go right through it. And he shows where he got shot in the dream. Got to be careful. Like, that's what happened to me. That is a nice little touch there that like they're showing that he doesn't have an actual memory of what happened or that it's potentially a conflict. Yeah, they're trying to build and explain sort of what happened to him there. Yeah, so that is actually a kind of nice little subtle touch. Anyways, coworker gives the, him a card, tells him to go ask for Mac if he ever goes to recall. You know, he could use some new memories because he is super bored on the assembly line. <laughs> and then he finds out that he's lost a promotion because of politics. Yeah, so he clearly isn't happy with this sort of life he has. And we're going to find out shortly that's not actually his life. But he's super unhappy in this place and that these sort of feelings or memories aren't working for him. Uh, and when he doesn't get that promotion because he's from the colony and not from the U, uh, UFB, UFB yeah. yeah, we start. this brings sort of some of those racist or colonial messages that you kind of see the way that they took it. And I don't think that that was a poor decision. Like, I think that kind of is a good way to push the, the plot forward, right? Yeah, the colony is clearly made out to be second-class citizens yeah. uh, in the hierarchy of this oh, world. absolutely. So that night, he leaves his wife at home and hits the bar where he meets up with Harry again, tells him more about his restlessness, including that the fact that he always wanted to learn how to play the piano. So he's really just very introspective right here. <laughs> <laughs> Which comes up later. Oh, it right? sure does. Like that's, yeah. that's a foreshadowing moment. Now, was that in the first one? No. Okay, so there's Definitely no piano not. playing. Okay. Nope. All right. He also tells Harry about the dreams he's been having. Harry basically uh, goes off on him and tells him to deal with what he's going through before he messes his shit up for good. Colin Farrell listens to him kind of, but he seems sort of unsure. And the next time we see him, he's in some kind of red light district. Yeah, he's in, like, we kind of mentioned this at the start. He's in a pretty shady place to go see or find out about Recall. The way that it's advertised on billboards, it's sort of felt to me like it was going to be a like futuristic or scientific or like almost a hospital setting where they do this at least in a nicer neighborhood like how are they yeah. affording this like prime billboard space if it's like some, some shithole in the hooker district <laughs> yeah it's right in the middle of where there are lots of women trying to get attention from men and then they sort of drop in what i i understand to be a reference from the first one. Oh, absolutely yes we meet the lady of the evening who propositions him and she has three boobs 
which <laughs> she tells him. Trust me, baby. You're going to wish you had three hands. Which, like, obviously, like, what, what, of course you are. That's the most logical statement ever. Uh, so I think that was sort of I, uh, something that was fun to throw back. It's about this time in the movie that I start to realize that I've seen this movie before. You've seen this version of Total Recall? I but have, not the original? Yes. So, oh, my God. What? <laughs> this, it's, it's about here and a little bit after that I realized that I have watched at least the first half of this movie before. <laughs> and it, it didn't dawn on me until now. Like, I'm a full 20 minutes into the story here, and I had no idea that I had seen this movie Shows before. how memorable an experience yeah, it must so have that, been. That yeah. tells you a little bit about how this movie sits with me. Oh, man. Uh, he's going to Recall, though, so he has no time for three-breasted delights uh he goes to recall he asks for mac and it's a bleach blonde john cho yeah the guy from nowhere white castle and star trek he's sulu in the most recent star trek movies that's right among other things uh they spend about 30 seconds debating the nature of reality and then john cho gives him some of the options just like in the original now colin farrell kind of perks up when he hears secret agent now obviously we've seen the whole thing and our podcast is full of spoilers he gives away the ending of the movie. John Cho's character says to Doug Quaid, why not work for both sides? And I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I wrote down double agent right here was yeah. sort of my, my plan. And But it's right after he sort of starts to perk up about the secret agent that we get this stern warning. Yeah. So they're about to do the procedure. But John Cho tells him it's crucial that no elements of his fantasy are based on reality, as apparently this can create massive problems in a person's psyche. You can't discern between, you know, what's real and what's not. Now, they do a test just to make sure in case people are lying to him. But as they're doing the test, suddenly, oh, shit, turns out he really is a spy. And wouldn't you know it, at that exact moment, a whole bunch of federal police bust in and they kill John Cho. They kill, yeah, there's other people working in there, too. They are not discriminated in who they're killing. Like every time they're trying to capture the Colin Farrell character, they are murdering everyone. Yeah. Uh, and they can't get him, right? Of course, they cannot hit him with one of their bullets, even though they're like synthetic machines with amazing aim and then some like garbage humans who lead them. Yeah, well, he beats up all the garbage humans and escapes using his newfound spy skills. He immediately races home. And by the time he gets there, the recall shooting is already on the news. It's being blamed on the resistance. He tells his wife the truth, and she tries to convince him that, you know, he's imagining it. It'll be okay. She gives him a hug and tries to kill him. Yeah, she goes to choke him out during this hug. And uh, here again is where I'm kind of getting flashbacks to have seen this movie before. I was like, oh, I know this part. So clearly it made an impression on me the first time I watched it. I guess so. <laughs> uh, this kind of comes out of nowhere. Turns out that she's been pretending to be his wife. She's really a UFB police intel, and she's been spying on him this whole time. And also, she has an accent now. Did she have the British accent before or no? No, she didn't. I didn't think so, yeah. no. So she she was sort of putting on a, an American accent uh, previously, but now that she can sort of be her true self, which is that agent of the UFB, she's, she's let it go. And then she tries to kill him, and then they go on a chase through the sort of tops of the city. Well, now, hang on. Before that happens, okay. there's a line in here that I wrote down because it's so f***ing ridiculous. He's very stunned about all this, and he says to her, but what about our marriage? And her response is, what can I say? I give good wife. Oh. She says. <laughs> That's awful, man. Really? Yes. Weird. That's terrible. Uh, yeah, no, I missed that one. Yeah. Uh, he wants to know who he really is. She isn't sure, but figures he must be important because, you know, otherwise, why is she there? Yeah. And now, yeah, we get a little more fighting. A super CG chase scene. Yeah, I actually thought the sort of area underneath them looked kind of cool. Um, but it definitely doesn't look real. Like, they do a good job of sort of showing a city and people and things below. But you can tell it's computer generated. You can see that they're sort of in a lot, kind of jumping over and through stuff. Oh, yeah, jumping on, over across rooftops. And at yeah. one point, they run through a house a la Point Break, which was a much, much, much better chase scene. <laughs> uh, it's essentially like CG parkour. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think parkour was popular at this time, and they definitely tried to work it into that piece. He escapes. Then he gets a phone call on his hand. <laughs> which yeah, i saw this no, no. yeah the, his phone is in his hand not a thing in the first one either yeah well i think his his wife uh with air quotes 
tells them to turn on his phone so that they can track him. And she okay. knows that a phone's implanted in him. And so it turns on and he's confused, right? He's like, what, what the f*** is happening? Why is my hand glowing? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then someone who knows him, but he doesn't know, tells him to put his hand on some glass. It's an old resistance friend. And this had to be like a video call, essentially. Yeah. In the call, the old resistance friend tells him he needs to get the key he also suggests he ditches the phone, but Colin Farrell is, uh, rightly so, does not know how that would work because it's, it's a f***ing hand. Well, he says that, but then like 30 seconds later, shatters some glass and just f***ing rips it oh, yeah. out of himself. Yeah, he decides to cut it out of his hand with some broken glass he finds in an alley, which, I mean, it does impress those emo teens that were there. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're super impressed. This is really weird because he gives the phone that he rips out of his hands to one of the emo teens. And of course, the military and the UFB sort of police track to the teen. Yep. And there's several scenes of this teen like protesting the military police taking his new hand phone. Yeah, he's really excited to have found that, I guess, have it given to him by a dude who's f-ing bleeding out his hand. Yeah, it was <laughs> super weird. Like, it Very seemed strange. unnecessary. I mean, this movie's pretty long, but if we were trying to pull a, or like find a Cooper Padding scene, like, this would this be is one it. for me. Yeah. 100% oh, yeah. this is it. His now ex wife gets a call from Cohagen, who is the leader and chancellor. Same name, by the way, as the first movie. Oh, okay. Who tells her he wants him alive and reveals some new information, which, whatever it is, we don't hear it, but it scares her enough that she immediately goes against his orders and tells her <laughs> men to kill him on sight. Yeah, it was so weird. They wanted him in alive, but she knows that they got to shoot to kill. The next time we see Colin Farrell, he's at a bank where he apparently has a safety deposit box. He gives some numbers, but doesn't seem totally sure about it. It works, though. And when he opens the box, he finds money, passports, not his passports. They have strange faces on them. And also some sort of circular collar looking device. Yeah, a metal device that clearly looks like it's for around your neck. Now, I'm embarrassed by this, but I should have known what this was based on the first one. Although the first movie works a little differently. But as soon as I saw this in action, I was like, oh, f- yeah, that makes sense. I'm an idiot. Oh, they used it in the uh, original? Something similar. It's not quite the okay. same, but it's similar enough that I felt bad for not noticing. So what it does is it puts the face of someone else or it replicates a face around you. So it sort of creates a hologram and and the faces that it makes match the ones that are on the passports in the box. There you go. There's also a data file in there and it's a video of him in the past explaining that his mind has been wiped. He tells him to get to the apartment and PS hope you found that key and you know what to do with it, which no, he has not found that key. (laughs) And so right now they're in the colony, right? They're on the one side and he has to go to an apartment in the UFB. So he's going to have to break his way in there. And of course, every single person is going to be looking for him. So this is where he uses that collar. And now you wouldn't recognize this given it's in the first one, but we get a nice little cameo by someone who looks a lot like the person Schwarzenegger pretends to be in the first movie. So in the first movie, he pretends to be a woman. And right before Colin Farrell goes to the scanner, uh, I'm not sure if it's the same woman because I have to believe that by now, 30 years later, she'd be much, much older. But like... A lady looking exactly like her comes through. I'm like, oh, shit. But it's not her. It's a fake out. Colin Farrell is the Asian gentleman behind her using this collar. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because me watching it, it felt like they were insinuating he was the woman. Yes. Right? Like, it, it, they put a lot of time on her. Um, and we had seen the passport of the person who was behind. So I was like, well, no, he's the person behind. Why are they showing this woman so much? But that makes a lot more sense now. There you go. Now, this also fails in the exact same way it did in the first movie because I guess you have to pre-program this, like, virtual head to talk. And he doesn't guess the questions right. So he ends up repeating himself. And then, you know, they're like, what? And it ends up triggering this whole thing. And now they know it's him. There's a shootout. There's a chase. He does an action hero jump at one point, kind of over the edge onto like a hovering car. And eventually, Jessica Biel pulls up in a flying car and gives him the old, get in quick. (laughs) So again, the UFB police are just like indiscriminately murdering all kinds of people trying to get to him. He takes down tons of people with some amazing shooting too, on a gun that he took off one of the agents who was there. Again, so CG-ish. Yeah. Though. It's oh, just yeah. CG Sounds the whole time. And, and then we get to this sort of magnetic car chase, which is awful. It's pretty bad. Yeah. I was kind of enjoying the movie up to this point, and it starts to really slant down as we go through this other process. And I mean, clearly it's not great if I've seen it before and I had forgotten it all. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, I was really struggling uh, after this point. Like This is where it really starts to like plummet for me. Yeah, so in this car chase, his wife is in hot pursuit with a couple of cop cars. Jessica Biel is shocked to find out that he's married and he works in a trailer line here. You're married? It's safe to say we're separated. <laughs> that was in the trailer? Oh, I must have been. I haven't seen the trailer, yeah. but I would bet all the yeah. money I have that's in there. 
they're trading paint for a bit, and then Jessica Biel causes a massive crash, which wipes out the cop cars, but Kate Beckinsale will not be deterred. She cuts them off, and now there's only one way to escape. Colin Farrell deactivates Max Ascension. <laughs> Is that what it's called? That's what it's called. So he turns off whatever magnets are holding it onto the highway that's sort of floating in the air, right? This highway's all fighting above the city of London, I think. I took it as hover jets. Okay, yeah. So they're hovering above? Well, but you're right. They must be attached because, uh, I don't know. We'll I thought see. they were magnetic. Like, So I thought that the road that is way up in the sky has these cars magnetically sort of pushed off of it. Okay. Like, I think that was sort of what was holding in place or how I interpreted the science. And when he turns it off, they plummet down. Or they drop like a stone. Right yeah. into what is, I guess, actual London. Yeah, street level. Yeah. Now, this is where I thought it was hover jets because right before they crash, he activates something again, and that basically creates this massive push of downward force that yes. crushes a parked car that is just there. Yeah, and I thought, to me, that was the magnets turning on again. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure how airtight this science is. In this <laughs> no, movie. I don't know. Either way, they crush a car that's on the street level. Their car flips, rolls, massive crash. Jessica Biel is really hurting. She's unconscious. So he takes her to the apartment. And once he gets there, he learns that he can play piano. Yeah, so here we get the piano callback. He sort of searched through his apartment looking for a key everywhere and can't find it. And he's sort of like at his wit's end when he sits down at this piano and just starts playing. And wouldn't you know it, the key that everyone's telling him to find, it's a piano key. Yeah, one of the keys is not playing the correct note. And after he hits it the second time, it connects for him. That's so terrible. As soon as I saw that, I'm just like, F guys, come on. <laughs> <laughs> just too easy yeah, yeah well it's another recording of past colin farrell but this time he has a badass goatee and tells him more information like for example he's not actually doug quaid his real name is carl hauser which is a sweet name also was that the name from the original hauser was the name i don't know if they ever say his first name in the original but hauser for sure turns out he's an assassin hired by cohagen to kill matthias but then he met a woman jessica beale and changed sides now he works for matthias but he's never met him because no one has. He needs to find him, though, because Cohagen is planning to build an even bigger army of robot soldiers, a.k.a. synthetics. So hurry and find him. Now, I feel like, much like John Cho and his line about why not be both sides, yeah. past Colin Farrell's goatee here, dead giveaway that he's evil. <laughs> Have you ever seen uh, either that old Star Trek episode or the South Park episode where there's an evil twin from Parallel Dimension. They yes, always have a goatee. They always have the goatee. As soon as I saw yeah. it, I'm like, oh, but there's so a dead here. giveaway. Yeah. The, I had some questions here. Uh, the double agent stuff I was writing down. Also, the Matthias, no one's ever seen him before is clearly not true. No, it's a very limited group of people. Like, yeah, a small, yeah. only a, oh, an inner circle. But they definitely him. say that, right? Like, yeah. that's sort of, and you're just like, well, that's bullshit. But, um, He's still fighting it, right? Like, he's still not sure. He still thinks he's Doug. And he, he goes to Jessica Biel to try to figure it out, right? Yeah, he's struggling with this for sure. She has more backstory for him. Turns out that dream at the beginning of the movie was real. That's an actual thing. And she shows him the scar on her own hand where the bullet, I guess, passed through both of them. Mm -hmm. Before they can get much deeper into it, cops show up. A lot of cops. Yeah, so this is the second or the third time in this movie where everything's been going fine. And then all of a sudden you have... Like, a hundred cops there immediately. Won't be the last time, either. No. Oh, well, which was bullshit, by the way. <laughs> I don't understand how they mobilize and move and arrive so quickly, right? They're just so effective. If this were true, why were they so inept at capturing him every time he f***ing gets away? Like, I don't know, man. His friend Harry is also there, and he's there to talk him down. See, Harry tells him that he's a projection sent into Doug Quaid's mind because none of this is real. He's still in the chair in recall. Not only that, his loving wife, Kate Beckinsale, is there with him, and he can snap out of this anytime, but in order for him to snap out of it, he has to kill Jessica Biel. That's what's <laughs> going to trigger this. Yeah, of course he has to murder her, right? Sure. Like That's the only way to get him out. I mean, the movie plays a lot with the idea that you could still be in that dream, like you could still be in the chair. And it could mess with you. And so I do kind of like the idea of this happening, of this scene in this conversation. Um, but it doesn't work effectively for me. Like, it, just at at the point that he's like, you have to murder her. And then as they, he starts to try to figure out that the details aren't quite right, really doesn't work. I, I wrote down here, rising tension-ish. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. It, it had promise. But I don't know if it was the, the writing or the sort of delivery of it all. And then, of course, does he shoot her? 
No, he shoots Harry. As soon as he shoots Harry, his concerned wife immediately turns back into the hunter-killer version of Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> uh, there's more gunfire. There's a bit of a standoff. And I'm like, why don't they just send in the robots? Can those robots die? They're like waiting around a corner. Like, I don't know. He's got his gun. They don't like, just send the f***ing robots in. He headshots one like five minutes later and just nothing happens. It's totally fine. Yeah, the robots are pretty much unstoppable. Yes. I'm not sure why if they have like a f***ing army of them, they haven't captured him already. Because the movie would be over. That's why. There'd yeah. be no f***ing movie. And this is the problem with having this whole army of f***ing robot soldiers, which by the way, was not in the first one. Why make these invisible robot soldiers... If they just if they could easily walk in there and capture him. Well, and we're gonna continue on the plot here, and we find out that Cohagen kind of has a plan for him. Yeah, so definitely. he doesn't really want those robot soldiers to grab him right here. Ah, okay, so maybe that is the logical reason. Yeah, that's although, that's the way I would explain it. But although last time I checked, Kate Beckinsale is trying to kill him, so why isn't she like robots get in there? Oh, well, she that is sort of her next step, right? She puts them in front of her as they try to go, but she only sends four robots. We get another daring escape, kind of. <laughs> you, you get a bit of wife versus girlfriend tension here. Yep. There's another chase, and then we get an elevator fight. This is the kind of like close quarters fight sequence with a bunch of quick cuts that so many other movies have done like better. Yeah, I was really confused about what the facility was. For a bit, I thought maybe it was like a warehouse facility and they were moving things until they fall into one of these boxes, right? Like you're kind yeah. of on the outside of it seeing all these boxes move around. It's a really fucked up elevator system. It's almost like train cars, just like yeah. constantly shifting position. But and, individual elevators. Yeah, it's very strange. And it, and it didn't make sense to me. At they probably all. don't want you to think about that. They're probably just like. They wanted it to look cool. They didn't care whether the future. it was yeah. a real practical thing or whether anyone would do that fucking shit. Yeah, man. Uh, this all ends with Kate Beckinsale putting a bomb in the elevators, but of course they escape. And at this point, I look at the clock and there's 45 minutes left in this movie. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm like, what are we doing? Uh, like, how come we're not closer? And, at yeah. the, and Kate Beckinsale's murdering everyone here too, right? Like, this is yes. her exploding and killing everyone. She she clearly doesn't care. Like, this seems like she just wants vengeance on this guy. I guess. She wasn't even really married to him. And it we was know. like three weeks. That was her job to pretend. And then she was ordered by her boss not to kill him. And she just keeps trying to kill him. God damn. Okay, so the, the heat <laughs> is getting turned up on Matthias. Yeah. A news report says there's evidence that his terrorist group is being funded by the colony and its governor. Politics. Yes. Well, and I, I write down in my notes here, clearly the British are the fucking worst, right? Like, this is <laughs> what yeah, they're telling us. And we would have a lot of people arguing the same about colonization, right? Like, this is yeah. what it's suggesting. And clearly the leader of the British here is self-interested and only worrying about himself and his uh, sort of group of elites and not the people in the rest of the world or in that colony. And I could see a lot of connections then between British colonialism in real life and what sort of happened. So yeah, I still don't understand what the impetus was to put that in this movie though. Yeah. I, why they switched it from the Mars thing. I don't know. It yeah. seems like an interesting decision. Yeah. Well, this could mean war. So they have to find Matthias ASAP. Well, we learned that they're going to send the soldiers on the colony, right? They're going to sort of send them after them. And apparently, Doug or Carl has the kill code in his head. Yes, there's some sort of way to shut down all the synthetics at once. And Jessica Biel takes him to where Matthias is hiding. It's called the No Zone, which <laughs> I was like, that's something. Yeah, um, and I guess if he gets the code to Matthias, they can stop that. Sort yeah, of the way about letter. the whole army. Yeah, um, the no zone is basically the area where the chemical warfare has happened. Yeah, it's uninhabitable, and it looks like it. It it looks pretty rough, right? You got all kinds of destroyed cities, but how do they get to it? I honestly don't remember. They take I, a subway car. Okay. So they go from the UFB into the no zone using subway cars, and it made me wonder how did the like UFB military or police or no one know that these cars were operating? Like, were they completely off grid? Was there some kind of like way that they were powering them without anyone knowing? Like, there must be a way to see that electricity is going into the no zone. Yeah, that could be one of those things where I almost wonder if like they sealed it off or something, and the resistance came and unsealed it, and then like they just assumed it was still sealed off, and you don't bother checking because you're right. I guess, but you could trace it. Yeah. Follow the electricity, right? Or in if they're using all of the technology they're using, you could probably follow the internet signal. Right, like this shit yeah. could be tracked pretty easily. So, well, especially in this advanced future. Yeah, wouldn't it be super easy to find him? I mean, it's one of the many plot holes in this movie. Yeah, okay. They when they get there, they mask up because they have to head out. You can't breathe, obviously. They head out, and it's time for a meeting. It is, as you mentioned, the singer from Love Actually, Bill Nye. I think that's how you say his name. <laughs> that's his and name. Yeah. He's doing an American accent. 
Yeah, it's weird. Um, and leader of the resistance. Yep, speaks in riddles, but he wants the info Colin Farrell has, so they strap him into a memory machine. Not only does it not work, it's a trap. Well, first of all, they say his head has a firewall, which is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like pulling an internet term, right? Trying yep. to make people wonder. And then, yes, it's a trap. And immediately, like immediately when they figure it out, hundreds of soldiers are in there. Well, but first, we get a little message. Cohagen shows up on the screen, who, by the way, Cohagen is played by Brian Cranston, star of Breaking Bad and many other such things. Malcolm in the Middle's dad. There you go. Yeah. Basically, he tells him in this video that there is no kill code. It was all a fake, which, duh. Like, I kind of figured that out <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, he quickly, quickly kills Matthias as soon as they get in there. And now they've got his info. They know his lo- like the locations of his troops, the number of troops, the plans. So the colony is about to fall. Yeah, they have completely destroyed the resistance here, right? This is where we figure out the whole time what they're trying to do is get Doug or Carl to go there and show that location. More obvious for you having seen the original. Does this happen yep. in the original as well? Uh, it does, yes. Okay. This was this is where Cohagen congratulates uh, Colin Farrell, Doug Quaid, Howser, whatever you're going to call him. Apparently, this whole thing was his idea, and I was, once again, I came back to the goatee. <laughs> you knew he was evil. You just yeah, knew it. You just knew. Um, what yeah. happens when you grow a goatee? I become uh, at least 50% more evil. Okay. Yeah. So if I see you with a goatee, I need to get you to shave it. If I ever see myself with a goatee... <laughs> you know that there's a problem? Oh, it's game yeah. over. Okay. I got to kill that guy before he kills me. That's, a, <laughs> that's what's going on. Uh, <laughs> they're going to bring the real Hauser back by putting his memories back in his body, but... The resistance guy from that first video clue is working on the inside and is one of the kind of like armed troopers who's there. He severs the arm straps that are keeping Colin Farrell in that chair, which allows Colin Farrell to break free. Meanwhile, back in the colony, there's lots of war talk and panic. We get footage of robot army kind of marching in there, which was giving me real like Attack of the Clones vibes which is not the movie that you want to emulate <laughs> if you are trying to make a movie people will enjoy. That's fair. It, you can tell that, uh, or, or you, we've learned throughout here, that the plan is to wipe out everyone in the colony, to actually murder them and replace them with synthetics, right? So to make all of the workers robots. And this will obviously be a lot easier for the for Cohagen and the UFB to get wealthy and not have to worry about any of those sort of resistance or colony people. Yeah, but you know what they didn't count on? Colin Doug Farrell. Quaid, yeah, yeah. <laughs> being the ultimate stopping machine. I at this point, I was like, "How is this one guy going to have any chance to stop this?" Now, I was like, "This is horseshit." <laughs> one, he's not going to get out. Like, if he gets out of this room, and I know he is because this is a movie. Um, he's already out, man. He's yeah, out. Well, and he he gets out of that arm. He kills a whole bunch of guys again, and he's on his way to stop this from happening. Yeah, he flies off in a plane, and that plane for some reason is totally unguarded. It's just sitting there, oh, fueled up and ready to go. I wrote that no down too. I was like super convenient helicopter or plane i was like what the hell yeah and then once he's in the plane he immediately gets landing access so um he rescues jessica beal in like 30 f-ing seconds like there was no they, they they dragged me through an hour and 15 minutes of this horse shit where it's just like every <laughs> scene the scenes don't need to be in there there's padding there's like 18 chase sequences but when it's time for a f-ing daring rescue 15 seconds and she's out well it's really weird where they have her held there's like nobody there he's there's like nobody, walking nobody's through anything. An, he's walking through an empty building he has a watch on his hand with a countdown timer and i was like what the fuck is that is that the moment that they're all gonna die in the colony they don't really show or explain it well they should die again right now because as soon as they get out they're caught immediately guards have them just dead to rights but for some reason instead of just killing them Cohagen sends Kate Beckinsale to deal with it which like you've got guys with guns right there just fucking shoot them why are you sending someone else from a different location well yeah the ridiculous LED light gun that our teenagers would all love to have and shoot those around their room is effective again right yep uh, but this time it gets in the hands of Colin Farrell well before that though like the, him having to send Kate Beckinsale keeps them alive just long enough for the gravity to go out because they're on the fucking fall oh yes I guess I mean they didn't really make that clear but I guess they're in there yeah so this caused them to escape and they end up on the outside of like the cab or car or whatever you fucking call it Cohagen and some goons spot them out there they like shoot them he like wings them a little bit we get a brief Hauser Cohagen fight yeah so this is really weird. Why is Cohagen there with all of his goons? Like he, I don't know. He's immediately in the perfect place for this fight to happen. The entire time, they've been shot at like thousands of times. And for the very first time, they both get shot in the shoulder. And then, yes, we get a fight between Malcolm in the Middle's dad and Colin Farrell. 
<laughs> yeah, and you're same. like, I'm not at all worried about Colin Farrell here. I'm no. like, well, this is going to go down super easy. But I know who wins that fight in real life. Well, yeah. And it's not Brian Cranston. No. No. But it's not going that way. Yeah, Cohagen's, uh he's kicking his ass, and he tells him he's going to erase those memories for good. But then Jessica Biel slides up in a plane and starts shooting like machine guns from this plane. Colin Farrell kills a robot by pulling its battery out of its chest which to me seems like a huge design flaw <laughs> well yeah this is really literally if he's yeah. buried out if he just reaches up and pulls up the battery's over i wrote this fight down too this robot was different from the others it was a different color and it seemed to be stronger and better than the other since then i was like why aren't there more of these and then yeah you're right he very simply rips off the chest and pulls out like a, a, a battery system or a power system that was really easy to access it was it was very very dumb yeah it, incredibly so now we get the real fight between Hauser, Quaid, and Cohagen. Uh, but while that's going on, a giant explosion wipes out most of the robots and the fall. Um, yeah, so I guess we find out that Colin Farrow had set this up. Like, this is what was corresponding to that watch that was in his hand. He had set up these bombs that were going to take it down. To prevent yeah, we saw him grab from... the bombs earlier, uh, yeah. and they put them in a bag, but we didn't really see him place that bag. I guess he yeah. placed the bag there. I, I, obviously. In exactly the right spot. At the right time. He knew how to take out the entire fall. And now we start. Now we start getting a little dialogue. Cohagen says to him, "Look at you, you're still fighting. You don't even know who you are." And then Colin Farrell gives us the uh, f***ing screenwriter high five line, which is, "I may not remember who I was, but I know who I am." <laughs> they must have just been like, "We got it. That's yeah, it. They knew it. That's they, it. They were in a circle after oh, that one." Oh Christ! You know. Yep. Stabs Cohagen with his own knife, and the fall is collapsing. So we get one last daring escape. It explodes, and the whole colony cheers. They made it. Or did they? No, the, his stupid wife, in quotes, is still alive. Like, she survives the explosions and crawls her way because she has this endless need to fucking murder him. Yep. Like, for no reason. Well, it seems like Colin Farrell might be dead. Like, he's very badly hurt. Jessica Biel can't wake him up. Yeah. They fade out, and then we hear some audio clips from earlier in the movie. Colin Farrell wakes up for, like, the 56th time in this fucking movie. <laughs> Jessica Biel's there, and she says, we made it. <laughs> but for that real this time? Yeah. yeah. Well, did we actually make it? Yeah. No, because like you said, his wife's still alive. He notices that Jessica Beale, in quotes, doesn't have a scar on her hand. Turns out it's Kate Beckinsale wearing one of those fing disguise collars. We get one more fight scene, and I'm like, just end the fing movie. <laughs> just end it. It's been going uh, on forever. But you're right. Then it moves to more wake up business of like, was he ever asleep? Was he ever awake? Like, how, how much or any of, of this was real? Well, they sneak one more of those in there too because he kills her and steps out of like, I guess it's like a trailer of some kind, sees Jessica Beale. They embrace. Um, there's news footage of the city rejoicing. And you get the kind of like, is this too good to be true thing? He sees a billboard again for recall, and it, it seems like he's kind of wondering. He's hesitating. Like, is this too good to be true? But you know what? He doesn't care. He decides he doesn't care. F*** it. Credits. We're out. They embrace. I also wrote down that, like, that recall part at the end where they sort of insinuate, was it all just a fake memory? It was just ridiculous. Does that happen in the original? God, you know, I should know the answer to that question, and... I feel like it's the, the nature of the story. It's based on a Philip K. Dick short story. And uh, I think the nature of it is you are meant to wonder whether or not this actually could all be in his head or if it's real or whatever. Okay. Um, but much like, I mean, at the end of the first one, Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't care either. So, yeah. Yeah. So they kind of walk off into the sunset, but they, they want to leave that open. I just, it was just done poorly. It was so on the nose. Like I thought that that could have been way better. But that you can say that about so many things in this movie. Yeah. So many things in this movie could have been done better. They were just done poorly. In, this whole movie doesn't need to exist. Yeah, and why was it just created for money? Like is that yes. the purpose of why they did That's it? That's all it is. Because it almost like a 90s version where they didn't have all the computer CGI and it just falls It's it, better. Yeah. You create right? a tangible world. This is why I'm generally pretty anti CGI and like the reason for it is it becomes obviously fake and i know like on some level having like creature effects or makeup like the three boobed lady in the first movie does not look very realistic whereas the three boobed woman in this one does look more realistic so my question is which one would you rather sleep with oh original she had this like uh big hair kind of retro look i love the 80s vibes all right <laughs> so okay uh we're gonna rate this movie now as we always do we rate it twice in the scale of one to ten. First, one to ten for how bad it is and then one to ten for how enjoyable it is the goal is to find a movie that is 10 out of 10 on both scales or as we call it the crit 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. i'll go first all right for i mean i always do yeah except that one time <laughs> uh 
<laughs> for me, how bad this movie is, it's bad. Like, it's not good. Like I said, it doesn't need to exist. It's way too long. They have unnecessary scenes. They throw in some stuff that they figure will be enough fan service to, like, get by with fans of the original. But it's not because the original is so much more enjoyable. I know it's not the enjoyable rating, but the purpose of this movie, if you're going to make a movie like this, you have to have either a reason for a remake or you have to do it in a way that will make everyone remember oh the first one was so great like I get to experience this again kind of thing and you don't experience it again Colin Farrell is not a stand-in for Arnold Schwarzenegger there's no comparison there I really think it was just he was the hot actor of the moment and they put him in there without any thought to whether or not he would credibly be able to pull this off and he doesn't um there's too much CG I have this as a nine bad. I can't give it a 10 because there are a couple of clever moments in there. And it like some parts do have good production values. They clearly invested a lot of time and money in this producer. John's not going to like that, but whatever. (laughs) So I can't give it a 10. I think it's a nine. What do you say? Yeah, I can't disagree with a lot of what you've said. It was a different perspective for me. um, Having not seen the first one, I didn't have the same level of expectation. Having realized I had seen it again and not remembered it sort of contributes more to my enjoyability rating, I think. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Contributes in a positive way? No. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I felt like watching it, I was in for the first 20 minutes, right? Like it was stringing me along, making me have some questions. And that probably has more to do with the like Philip K. Dick short story than with the actual production of this movie. I agree with so many of the criticisms you had. Um, So much unnecessary stuff, so much absurd stuff. The CGI didn't play well. There wasn't a standout acting performance, right? There was nothing that was was excellent there. So I also wrote it down as a 9 bad. Okay. So I, I had it there. I didn't give it a 10 because I guess it had me connected for a few times. And, and it did sort of look good and play good in, in many of the places too. Okay. So how enjoyable on the scale of 1 to 10 for you? It's funny. Uh, I was talking to a friend of the show and letting him know that we were going to be recording this one. And he's a huge fan of the first one. Name drop him. Who is and it? And a friend of the show, BJ, uh, was told me that he saw this on a plane. And he, you know, when you see a movie on the plane, you're on a long flight, you don't really care what you want to watch, right? You'll watch anything. He regretted his time spent watching it. Well, <laughs> like, yeah. so that had me sort of set up going in, and then as we're about halfway or like two or a third of the way through, I start realizing I'd watched it before. I was like, "Oh my goodness, he is right. This is a waste of time." And so, my enjoyability for this thing is a five. My God, that's so much higher than I was expecting you to say. Yeah, a five. Well, I was pulling the start. Your time is not worth your, a waste of time. Is a five for you? Well, it's interesting. I struggle on this one because in the bad rating, we almost never go below a five. But I guess in the enjoyability, I can I can go lower than that. But yeah, for me, I had it around that five. Of course, I'm never going to watch this for a third time. <laughs> never, no. <laughs> Somehow, I've watched it for a second time, <laughs> yeah. and that breaks most of the rules. But I'm throwing a five at it for uh, for enjoyability. Okay. Does that change some of your thoughts? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, I have this as a one. Oh. This movie is a complete waste of time. And I would be interested to see. We have to watch the original. We'll watch it as a bonus episode. It's not a bad movie, but you have to see it. Okay. And I feel like after you've seen it, I would imagine your enjoyable rating would change. Because the first one is bright and colorful and funny and like fast paced and it's enjoyable. And this is none of those things. This is a grim, dark, kind of bland, just like gray on beige Like, this is a joyless cash grab of a movie. (laughs) It takes everything that was good about the first one and just f***ing ignores it. All right. And that's why I say, when you see it, I'm very curious to hear if you want to change your rating. We'll give it another rating after watching the original. Sure, man. Because this is, compared to that, it's just, you're comparing apples to, like, steaming turds. (laughs) So that works out to a 10 from you. And for me, it's a 50 in there on the scale, which is pretty oh mediocre, God, right in the middle. That's too high. I don't know what yeah, you're yeah. doing. I don't <laughs> no, it's a 14. You said 9 and 5, Oh, right? uh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, 14. So that's, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't yeah. know how you called this. Like a, a, a 5 out of 10 is like a coin flip. I can't believe you would land like neutral on enjoyability. I, I watched it. It kept me through. I had, I've sat through it twice now. None of, none of <laughs> yeah. the performances were. But if you um, don't remember the first time, did it really happen? Uh, <laughs> true. Maybe what it was is all the nature a dream. of reality? Was oh it all God. a dream? Maybe I haven't watched it at all. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they put the memories in me that I have watched it and it was okay. I think uh, maybe that's what happened. My MGM last recall pictures session, was yeah. like, we're going to make this guy think he's seen this piece of shit before. My last recall session, they have they, they messed around with oh me. Oh, my God. Man. Yeah. 
Okay, what about the beer, though? Um, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> more or less than the movie. Oh, more. Yeah. Oh, so oh, yeah. much more. Yeah, I would rather have spent two hours drinking this uh, fermented table sour than uh, watching Colin Farrell do a homeless man's Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. <laughs> yeah, I quite like it as well. It has a mixed fermentation. Um, and so usually that means they'll use different yeasts. Other beers I've had, they call it wild yeast. Okay. So like a different strain. So when they sort of brew beers, they usually use traditional yeast, and those sort of give traditional flavors to the beer. But a lot of craft brewers have gone to more wild or varied yeast strains, and they can really impact the sort of flavor or the finish of the beers. And you can tell that the two years in a bottle uh, with this one, using some of those mixed fermented yeasts, add a lot of flavor and depth to it. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's nice and light. Um, 4.5% alcohol is very easy to drink, which is always nice for me. You know, this this season, we've really had a lot of beers that have been kind of like easy on this guy. I wonder who's been choosing a lot of these matches lately. <laughs> well, oh, come on, man. Listen, you, you go with what's out there. I, I know. It's hard. we got to find beers that connect in some way. And I, I think the idea of memory trace is a sweet connection with uh, the Total Recall theme. Yeah. Um, fits nicely. Again, so much better than the movie. Next week, we are going to be... We're going to be watching a movie. What are we watching? Called Deathbed, colon, The Bed That Eats. <laughs> is this a modern movie? Is this an old movie? Oh, my movie? God, no. This is like a 70s. This is, this is really something. And if you've never seen Deathbed, I strongly encourage you to seek it out. Yeah. It is just ridiculous. And I'm looking forward to it just to get us away from the dour soullessness of this movie. <laughs> Oh, man. You are very down on Total Recall, the new... 100%. But yeah. you know what? It's out of my life. We're moving on to better things. Yeah, we don't Next care. week, Deathbed. Please join us for that. If you haven't already, you can find us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, at the BMB Podcast. If you have any suggestions uh, for beers and or movies, feel free to send us an email at thebnbpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, we just covered a request last week of Jaws the Revenge. we got a couple more coming up this season, but we can certainly uh, fit some more in for later on in the year. Until then, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. We'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it dreamy. Is it real or is it recall?